We are speeding through this first letter to Timothy. And that being the case, we're only hitting a few of the major points in the letter. Some of the major points uh, that are missing may come to mind for some of you who recognize this letter to Timothy as being one of those that has that in-your-face argument against women in leadership positions. Now, I was asked about this, a really good question about this last week after the service. And that uh, got me thinking. Um, you know, and the question was about whether or not I would address this issue. Um, because the lectionary uh, doesn't um, have that scripture where this issue is, is presented. And it got me thinking, it got me wondering if any uh, of others of you out here are, are wondering about that as well. Wondering if that might get addressed. Uh, what do we do with that part? Part of First Timothy, since we're dealing with other parts, because that actually shows up in the second half of the chapter we were just looking at last week, but didn't touch on. Uh, time won't serve us well to try to deal with that topic fully today, as we already have a piece of scripture to deal with. Uh, but I will say a quick something about it in case anybody else is wondering. After all, um, there is an argument against women in leadership that does present itself in Timothy. And here, 2,000 years later, it remains a divisive topic in churches. Some churches are for, some churches are against. And what do we do with that? It's fantastic for uh, Bible study or Sunday school where we could discuss and each share our perspectives. But as for now, uh, what I have to say about it is that sometimes we need to challenge particular scriptures um, based on the bigger picture. In the bigger picture, we find examples such as in 1 Timothy that women should play a quiet, supporting role. Uh, and then we also find examples such as in Romans where Paul appoints Phoebe as a deacon and insists that the congregation listen to her and respect her leadership. There are congregations where the First Timothy example works well. And there are congregations like ours where the Romans example works well. And personally, I'm, I'm all for Phoebe, as you could probably guess, being that I'm in the disciples' tradition. We, we uh, ride with, with Phoebe, I think. But... Just as there is diversity today in our churches, there was certainly diversity in the early church. And that's a good thing. Being a congregation that embraces women in leadership with wide open arms and relies on women in leadership in many, many ways, um, which I think has been said by some of you in the congregation, I don't know where this congregation would be if it wasn't for the women. Uh, it's still important for us to wrestle with those scriptures uh, that don't quite work well in our own context, such as what we didn't touch on uh, specifically in 1 Timothy this month. Although there are some particular teachings in the Bible that don't work well for every congregation and then are divisive, we don't all agree on, um, there's a lot more scriptures and teachings that do work for all of us across the board. That's really why the lectionary, um, the schedule of scripture readings that we follow, um, it goes with certain scriptures and skips others. It skips over the more divisive kind of scriptures so that in worship we can focus on things that um, are more important and that really bring us back together. Today it's about real life. Life that really is life. Whether or not I agree with the teaching in this letter about women in leadership, there's no question about this, what we're finding right in front of us this morning, about how it's understood, how life is understood in Scripture, and what makes it real. To begin with, there's great godliness, great gain in godliness and contentment. Great gain. To be a person of God, prayerful, grateful, welcoming, a faithful servant of God, while it's not typically rewarded by the world, there is great gain in it. That there is great gain in it is, is an extreme understatement. 
Whatever the world has to offer doesn't matter anyway. We came into it without a thing, and we'll go out of it without a thing. Can't take any of it with us. So obviously, we should be content with what we have. No need for that endless search for happiness and material things. We are with the one who provides everything that is, ever has been, and ever will be important. As far as our physical needs go, obviously we have physical needs to think about. But as long as we've got food and clothing, we've got plenty to be content with. That desire for more, it inevitably leads to less. The road of temptation leads to traps. Traps shaped by senseless and harmful desires. Traps that end in our own ruin and destruction. There's nothing wrong with having more, but the endless desire to have more, the love of having more, specifically the love of money, is a root of all kinds of evil. Now I think in this letter, the, this teaching was worded carefully by the author for good reason. We don't want to confuse what's being said uh, with the idea that money and stuff is bad in itself. Even having lots of money and stuff, that that's bad in itself, because it's not. But loving money and stuff... As you love your spouse, as you love your family member, as you love your friend, or as you're supposed to love your neighbor. Loving money and stuff in that kind of way is the very beginning point of all kinds of evil. A root. I think this is worded carefully because there were wealthy members of the early church. I mentioned Phoebe earlier who was appointed by Paul as a deacon. She was one of those early church members who was wealthy and overall a person of significant status in society. People such as her were huge in the early church. They provided homes where the churches met. They provided important resources that supported the church's existence. Paul mentioned being provided for by the generosity of church members. Those would definitely be the ones with wealth enough to spare and provide for his ministry to happen. Despite having money and stuff, such Christians were not led away from the faith, but towards it. They were not piercing themselves with many pains by putting their resources on the line for Christian faith to prosper. They were actually blessing their own lives and everybody around them. With or without money, what we are called to pursue is righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness, humility, generosity, overall goodness, and eternal life. As we found it in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In that, there is so much to gain, so much more to gain than in anything found on this earth. In that, there is life that really is life. Now, there's lots of issues in the Bible that we can find to argue about. There's a, quite a few. Women in leadership is a great example of that. We could argue till our heart's content. As there are scriptures standing on both sides of that issue. It's no surprise that all Christians, um, that not all Christians agree on which way to go about it. But I think we can all agree on what lies before us today. That life is better. Life is more meaningful. Life is more complete. Life is more real when we live it the way God calls us to live it. It's as plain as day. The scriptures proclaim this fact over and over again. Evidence is all around us, whether in our own lives or the lives of loved ones and other people we know. But life is better and more real when we live it as God calls us to live it. With the love of God, with the generosity and grace of God. That godly and contented people are more happy and better off. And because, uh, because of this, even a poor person can be better off than a rich person, despite daily financial struggles. So why do so many of us ignore it? 
Why do so many of us pursue empty stuff for a better life? Like we've been convinced and brainwashed that that really will, will make our lives better. Like the rich person in Lazarus, the rich man didn't realize it until he died. That his life would have been so much better off if his heart was generous. After his death, he wanted to warn his loved ones about this so that they wouldn't end up like he did. But then he was told the truth, that if their love really was for money and stuff, they wouldn't listen even to someone who was raised from the dead. Their heart was where their heart was. If we are going to live a real life shaped by God's indisputable teachings, first, our love has to be for God. God has to be the one we care about the most. God has to be the one we are serving. We're reminded in no uncertain terms, we can't serve God and wealth. We've got to choose. That will determine how good and how meaningful, how complete and how real our lives will be. Some things we find in the Bible do come down to context. But this here is definitely for every one of us. When we read a letter such as 1 Timothy, let's not get too caught up with the contextual stuff. Let's cling to the bigger picture. Let's cling to what's really important. That God loves us. So let's love God. Let's be godly people. Let's be content. Let's live real lives in which we embrace and build up others. By doing so, we build up ourselves and our communities, particularly the community of God. God provides richly. So in God, we live richly. The real kind of riches. May we take very seriously everything that we find in Scripture. May we wrestle with the ideas together with grace. May we focus especially on what we know is for us. May our lives be more real and more beautiful than anything money can buy. Amen.